Hi everyone, here's a question for you. Has being under lockdown changed the way you consume and access news? Have you ditched podcasts in favor of scrolling online? Have you changed who you get your information from? That's what we are discussing here today, the way COVID-19 and the pandemic has reshaped the news industry. Since the pandemic, some news organizations have been thriving, while others have had huge layoffs and others have even shut down completely. So what's going on and what does it mean for you? Rasmus Nielsen, the executive director of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at the University of Oxford, is here with us to help answer some of these questions. Rasmus, thank you for being with us. Uh, last year, at this time, I guess you would have done a lot of uh, presentations of the Digital News Report on the road. Uh, how has this changed for you? It's been quite remarkable. Uh, last year, I spent 23 of the 30 days after we published on the road. This year, I've given many more presentations, more than 30 so far, but all of them from my living room right here. So I guess COVID changed our lives in general. How has it changed the way we consume news? First of all, there's been a big uptick in news consumption, in particular in the early stages of the crisis. Uh, people were faced with a very uncertain situation with very urgent questions about how they can protect themselves, their loved ones and their communities. So in the UK, for example, the BBC in particular saw a, a big uptick. Uh, this goes online. It also goes for television uh, in, to some extent, as people are in lockdown and find themselves at home with more time in their hands. And then, of course, there are other forms of, uh, of news news that have suffered, like print newspapers in particular. Print circulation through shops and the like has been greatly hit by, by the lockdown in many cases. Do you think any of these trends will actually last? And if so, how will they actually eventually shape the future of news? The big impact here is the an acceleration of the move to a more digital, more mobile and more platform dominated media environment. And people who were habitual print readers you know, will in some cases uh, return to the habit of picking up print, but many of them will have found, as, as many of us have over the years, that digital is, is more convenient, it's more compelling, and offers a great uh, variety of choice. The increase in television news consumption arguably is, uh, is in part about people's need for and desire for trustworthy news from, from providers they trust in a format that they're familiar with. But of course, some of it is also just that people have a lot of time on their hands, so that I would uh, expect to dissipate uh, quite quickly. Trust in news is an issue, especially in countries where the political discourse is polarized and, uh, and is divisive. What changes have you seen as a result of COVID-19 and how does this compare with trust in, in the social media platforms that we know is the way through which so many people are consuming their news? Trust in news is only in part about uh, people's perception of the editorial quality of a news provider and about their perception of whether a particular news provider you know, reflects and respects the values of people like themselves. As the political discussion around how we as societies respond to the coronavirus crisis grew more explicit and often more heated and people came to disagree more vigorously and openly about how to handle this, that has had an impact. If we then sort of compare across news media and different kinds of social media, we continue to find a very pronounced what we call a trust gap uh, around news specifically where there are many more people who say that they trust the news that they get directly from news organizations than say the same thing about the news that they get via social media uh, such as uh, Facebook uh, or for that matter video sharing sites like YouTube or messaging applications like WhatsApp. The platforms are used in value for many things but often regard with some skepticism when it comes to the news that they surface in particular. And this trust gap that you're referring to, is it a global trend? There are some differences from country to country, often in sort of Northwestern Europe, uh, where there is a relatively high trust in news and relatively limited levels of political polarization, sort of compared to many other parts of the world, news that people get from the news media directly is generally more highly trusted than news that people get via search uh, and social. But there are many parts of the world where where trust is almost uniformly low across the board and it's largely about people having much lower trust in the news than about them having a higher opinion of, of platforms. Local news media are key sources of independent information for their communities. We know that these outlets are some of the hardest hit ones because of the pandemic. What are the implications of the, the crisis? I mean, this is really one of the areas that worry me the most. All of us live our lives locally, and there are many issues that may be global trends, but 
we ultimately also have to understand in the context of the actual community in which we live or which we are part. In the United States a few years ago, um, a researcher did a piece of work for the Federal Communication Commission. Not only did he find that all news and information providers in the US accounted for only about 3% of all the time that people spend online, he also found that local news providers specifically was only half a percent. That the majority of the attention that people gave to news was spent with national and international news and not the things that were closer to their community. So if we look at the future of local news from a business point of view, if local news only has say half a percent or maybe one percent of people's attention online, it stands to reason it's going to be very hard to build a business, at least a business that is as lucrative as local news was in the past. We have seen the New York Times, for example, adding almost 600,000 new digital subscription in the first quarter alone of 2020. And this is at the same time when the FT, to give you some context, estimates that about 38,000 people working in the news industry have been either laid off or furloughed or forced to take a pay cut. How do you explain it? I mean, I think it's a powerful reminder of uh, the fundamental forces of you know, what has been called creative destruction where digital technologies fundamentally they do away with many of the uh, you know market barriers that that created local markets for for news and information and for advertising and they create national even international or global markets with far more intense competition even the bbc as a giant accounts for something like 1.5 percent of all the time that people in the uk spend spend on the internet that's about one-tenth of the time people spent with Facebook and less than one-tenth of the time that people spent with different Google products and services. So in this winner-takes-most market, you know, the big platforms tend to capture a very large share of attention. They also capture a very large share of the advertising that historically went to publishers. And then when we turn to sort of content that people pay for, again, you know, we see very strong winner-takes-most dynamics. A few large upmarket publishers tend to capture a very large share, even the majority of all subscriptions to digital news. If you're one of those publishers, that's great. Uh, Louis Dreyfus, the publisher of Le Monde, uh, has called this a virtuous circle. You know, Dagens Nude in Sweden is reporting great results. El Diario in Spain, New York Times, of course, you know, great success. And then a much greater number of titles uh, who are really, really struggling to generate the kinds of revenues that they did historically, just because the market has changed so fundamentally and because all of us are spending our attention and our money in ways that are not primarily tied to news. Rasmus, we could continue this conversation for hours. Um, thank you for being with us. Thank you for being on TC Talk. Thank you, Antonio. Thanks for having me. That's all for today's episode of TC Talks, the online spin-off of our annual human rights event, the Trust Conference. Since you're here, do subscribe to our YouTube channel and keep an eye on my Twitter account, Anto Zapulla, to find out what's coming up next. Thanks for watching. See you next time.